Good evening, good, good morning to Dana in the other end of the US. Um, I'm very glad to uh, welcome all of you to this evening that um, uh, Professor Consoni uh, organized an event to celebrate Tommy, Professor Herzig's latest book, A Conference Tale, Tale Art, Crime, and Jewish Apostasy in Renaissance Italy. It actually sold it like day already two years ago, but it takes a long time in this time of Zoom and COVID to organize events like this. And I want to thank Professor Consoni for organizing this uh, event. I'm very happy, pleased to uh, welcome the three prominent scholars who agreed to participate in this um, event. And I thank all the members of the audience for joining uh, us today. The um, Talmudic sages says, say that the person is jealous of everyone except for his own students. <laughs> and, and obviously there are much kinder people than I am because I've always been jealous of Tammy and her academic career and her academic um, success, of the enthusiasm, the energy she has towards her sources, um, the personal involvement with the men, but mostly women, she uncovering the archives, but above all her ability, really amazing ability to find documents and stories that have been hidden in plain sight for hundreds of years and no one has paid attention to them until she came and realized what amazing potential they have and what amazing stories could be told. This was the case about Savona Roland Nuns, her first book, the nuns who cultivated the, the cult of uh, the Florentine um, prophet after his death. It was the topic, of, it was the, the discovery she made connecting the witch hunter, um, Inquisitor Heinrich Institoris with the examination and the affirmation of Lucia Botticelli's stigmata and visions, topic of a second monograph. And now in this new book with the drama of three generations of the Salamone, the Federally family of converted Jews. Uh, for her contribution to the study of religious conversion, she won the Kedar Family Award for Outstanding Research in 2019. The book itself won the American Historical Association 2020 Dorothy Rosenberg Prize for the best book in the history of the Jewish diaspora. And it was awarded an honorably man, honorable mention uh, of the Renaissance Society of America, 2021's Golden Book Prize in Renaissance Studies. It is currently being translated in both Italian and Hebrew. Tami has been the recipient of numerous prizes and fellowships, and I will only mention the very recent 2021 Bruno Award, the highest distinction in Israel for younger or relatively younger scholars. She is a professor of history in the Faculty of Humanities, Vice Dean of Research at Tel Aviv Universities. And in recent years, she has started developing an interest in Jewish Christian Muslim relations in Renaissance Italy, and her current research focuses on female Jewish slavery in early modern Italy. We will proceed as follow. I will first ask Tammy to say a few things about the book, and then we'll ask each of the three speakers to talk about the book for about 10 minutes. This will be followed by conversations among the speakers, and then I will open the floor for questions and answers. And to save us some time, um, I will present our three very distinguished speakers uh, right now, and they join us from really all corners of the Northern Hemisphere. Then, no, Siberia is not included. Dana Katz is joining us from uh, Reed College, where she is the Joshua C. Taylor Professor of Art History and Humanities. Her research explores representations of religious difference in the art and culture of early modern uh, Italy. She is the author of The Jew in the Art of the Italian Renaissance, University of Pennsylvania Press 2008, and The Jewish Ghetto and the Visual Imagination of Early Modern Venice, Cambridge UP 2017 and 19. Their current book project, Materials of Islam in Pre-Modern Europe, studies the material effects of Christian and Muslim encounters. 
Mary Levin of Jesus College, Cambridge, is a pr prolific uh, author and has published widely on the social history of religion in early modern Italy and beyond. I will mention just one of her publications, the wonderful monograph, Virgins of Venice, that I've been teaching for many, many years. She co-directed a large ERC project on domestic devotion in Renaissance Italy, and is now embarking on a new project with Emily Michelson on religious and ethnic diversity. She particularly enjoyed the challenges of working with material culture and co-authors to co-curated two exhibitions uh, in Cambridge at the uh, Fitzwilliam Museum on treasures, treasured possessions from the Renaissance to the Enlightenment and on Madonnas and Miracles, the only home in Renaissance Italy. Mira Rubin is Professor of Modern and Early Modern History at Queen Mary University of London. Like Tommy, she received a BA and MA in History from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and developed interest in social and cultural history um, within a religious setting of medieval Europe. She has taught at Cambridge um, and Oxford and has enjoyed visitorships in Europe, the US, Israel, and other places. She's the author of eight books and more than a hundred articles, and she will excuse me, I hope, if I will mention only the two books that I think are most relevant to our meeting today, Gentile Tales, The Narrative Assault on Late Medieval Jews of 1999, and the very recent series of Strangers Making Lives in Medieval Europe, Cambridge UP 2020, which is one of the very few books, I think, uh, of quote unquote, general medieval uh, history, they take the Jewish experience to be an integral, really integral part of European um, history. Um, so the floor, Tommy, is yours. And again, I welcome everybody who is joining us. Thank you, Moshe. I, I don't think I can really add anything of value after this introduction, but I will try. Uh, it is wonderful to see all of you, even if remotely, and I'm very grateful to Manuela Consoni for her persistent efforts to organize this book event, uh, which started shortly after the book came out, not yet two years ago, Moshe, I should point out, uh, but time stopped uh, passing with the pandemic. Uh, the book actually came out in, in December 2019, uh, but nobody could get hold of a copy because of the uh, lockdowns and everything. Um, and so the on-site event that Manuela was planning uh, for May 22 had to be postponed. Um, it was originally supposed to take place in Mount Scopus, and I was really looking forward to this opportunity to return to my alma mater, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, but then Manuela um, suggested that we not only postpone it, but then also use the opportunity to turn it into an international online event, uh, which gave me the wonderful opportunity of um, having some of the people who had uh, the greatest influence on my thinking about early modern Catholicism, Jewish Christian relations, religious conversion and material culture participate. Um, so I'm really very grateful and uh, to, to Dana Katz, Mary Levin, and Mary Rubin, and I'm very eager to hear their thoughts on the book. And I'm very thankful to uh, Moshe Sluchowski, who, as you heard, um, had been my uh, PhD supervisor and is and always will be my uh, mentor and the first reader of basically every piece of something that I ever write, including this book. So he was the first uh, one to, to go over a draft. So this book owes much to, to his comments. And now I will talk a little bit about the book. Uh, mostly I will, um, I do want to show you one image, but I will then turn this off. I just, sorry. I have just three images um, to give you an idea of the, person we're talking about. Um, but um, as you can tell from the title, it is basically a study of Jewish conversion to Christianity. And up until now, most studies of individual converts from Judaism in Renaissance Italy have approached the topic from the perspective of intellectual history. 
Such studies are largely based on texts that apostates wrote to endear themselves to church authorities, texts that show us mainly what their Christian patrons uh, were interested in. And in any case, the majority of baptized Jews in 15th and 16th century Italy did not consist of scholars or rabbis. Many of them were women. Others were men of the artisanal or lower classes who did not leave behind erudite conversion narratives. A convert's tale aims at providing a social history of conversion by reconstructing the life story of Ercole dei Fideli, previously called Salomone da Sesso, a goldsmith and engraver considered by modern scholars as one of the two greatest Jewish artists of the Italian Renaissance. I'm just showing you this one example um, of one of the swords that's attributed to him. And now I'll uh, stop um, screen sharing for some time so you can um, see each other, which is probably uh, create some kind of an illusion that we are actually in, a, in some kind of gathering. So the book draws on archival evidence to uncover the complex dynamics leading to the apostasy, not only of Salomone, but also of his wife and children, and to elucidate what their daily life looked like, both before and after their baptism. In so doing, it illuminates the short and long-term implications of conversion for the female and male members of a Jewish family at the height of the Renaissance. As is well known, after the outbreak of the Lutheran Reformation, the Catholic Church turned the conversion of Jews into one of its priorities. As part of the efforts to gain new souls and thereby compensate for the souls that were lost to Protestant reformers north of the Alps, Catholic efforts to convert the Jews in Italian lands became increasingly institutionalized. During the 1540s, the ecclesiastical establishment adopted various measures geared at augmenting the number of Jewish baptisms. These included the foundations of houses of catechumens, first in Rome and then in other Italian cities, and from 1542 also involved the newly established Roman Inquisition, which prosecuted Jews who were suspected of impeding Jewish baptisms and neophytes who were accused of reverting to Judaism, also as a means of increasing conversionary pressure. Due to the wealth of material preserved in the archives of the houses of catechumens and the tribunals of the Roman Inquisition, records of these institutions have hitherto served as the primary lens for exploring Jewish conversion to Christianity in pre-modern Italy. Now, the success of the ecclesiastical campaign to convert Italian Jews from the mid 16th through the 18th centuries was no doubt unprecedented. Its roots, however, lay in the pre-Reformation era. A surge in the number of converts was already well underway in the early 15th century, and the century's last decades saw a marked rise in Jewish baptisms across cities and towns in central and northern Italy. These went hand in hand with the growing attention that writers of lit various literary, dramatic, and musical channels ascribed to Jewish conversion. The lack of institutional documentation for this earlier period has rendered it more difficult to uncover the significance and ramifications of apostasy from Judaism before the Council of Trent. As a result, the motivations leading Jews to embrace Catholicism and the prospect that awaited those Jews who crossed over to the Catholic side before the mid 16th century still remain relatively understudied. In recapitulating Salomone de Sesso's life story, I've attempted to shed light on these unexplored facets of religious conversion in pre-Tridentine Italy. Now, Salomone converted in 1491, very shortly before the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492. And when we think about Jewish conversion in this period, we tend to think about the forcible conversions that occurred in Spain and Portugal in the face of pogroms and threats of expulsion. The main difference between Italy and Spain is that there were no mass conversions in central and northern Italy. Italian Jews in this period converted alone, although individual baptisms forced the conversion of apostates' children and often also of their spouses. This typology of conversion renders the microhistorical investigation of the dynamics leading to the baptism of a single Jew 
and of the impact that it had on his or her, or her family, particularly suited for clarifying the challenges of Jewish conversion in Northern Italy. So this is why I decided to employ this methodological approach. Unlike the vast majority of 15th century Italian apostates from Judaism, Salomone da Sesso left behind a long paper trail. I'm very grateful for that. This was the result of his occupational status as a celebrated artist whose work was very much in demand. And I'm using this opportunity to show you just another example of his works. So this is his best known work, the so-called Queen of Swords um, that he made for Cesare Borgia. And um, so he was very, uh, uh, very famous artist whose work was very much in demand. And I'll, now that I let you enjoy this, I'll step out of the uh, screen sharing again. Salomone that fits into the category that Italian historian Eduardo Grandi has termed the exceptional normal. That is, he was one of those outstanding individuals whose life stories may nonetheless serve to illuminate the quotidian realities of larger social groups in Salomone's case of Italian Jews and first generation converts. Even though his artistic virtuosity distinguished him from most Jews prior to his baptism and from other converts thereafter, in many respects, his experiences were influenced by his religious identities, first as a Jew and later as a recent convert to Catholicism. As I argue in the book, the unfolding of Salomone's life story demonstrates that just like Christian artists, Jews whose cre creative impulse aroused the admiration of wealthy patrons were prone to provoking the animosity of envious rivals and disgruntled employees. This could easily culminate in delations followed by implications in real, but also in trumped up offenses. When brought to trial, however, high profile Jew uh, Jewish defendants were vulnerable to particularly harsh punishments and were also subject to considerable pressure to convert. Indeed, on the eve of the reformation, some secular rulers were willing to go even further than ecclesiastical authorities demanded of them by offering condemned Jewish felons pardons in exchange for baptism. Conversion to Catholicism provided apostates with social and economic opportunities that had not been available to them as Jews. So as a Catholic, the goldsmith Salomone could assume, who was now Ercole dei Fideli, could assume the honorific appellation of master craftsman, which Jews could not enjoy. He also received grant commissions for religious works that Jews were barred from creating. His sons followed his lead and became goldsmiths too, working in the service of his aristocratic patrons. And I'll show you my final image of one of these patrons. Oh, it's not working. I'll just leave it. Not too challenging to deal with it. Did you get to see the uh, portrait of Lucrezia Borgia at all? You did. Okay, so that, that's Lucrezia Borgia was uh, their last uh, uh, aristocratic patron. Eager to showcase the success of their conversionary policy, these patrons selected one of Salomone's daughters as a lady in waiting uh, for Lucrezia Borgia, Ferrara's Duchess, and also sponsored them on accusation of another daughter. Dissolving all ties to converts Jewish origins, however, was impossible. 30 years after their baptism, local Jews still remember the scandalous conversion of Salomon and his family. When the opportunity came in 1521, these Jews played a leading role in securing the downfall of their former co-religionists. So despite theologians' claims to the contrary, baptism did not really turn converts into new men, and the lingering shadow of their Jewish past never ceased to haunt them. And I'll stop here mainly because I want to hear what uh, the people who did not write the book have to, to say about all this. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy, very much. And I will ask Professor Katz to say a few things about the book. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for this invitation to speak on Tamar's wonderful accomplishment. Brava, Tamar, davvero. Things 
expose relations in and between societies. As anthropologist Arun Apadurai argues, even though from a theoretical point of view, human actors encode things with significance, from a methodological point of view, it is the things in motion that illuminate their human and social context. In A Convert's Tale, Art, Crime, and Jewish Apostasy in Renaissance Italy, Tamar Herzig mobilizes early modern things to explore what inanimate objects reveal about the animate world. She looks at and beyond the materiality of bracelets, swords, as we just saw, tabernacles, book covers, buttons, hat badges and fans to think, rethink how such things represent identity, assert power and dictate taste. In A Convert's Tale, Tamar presents a micro history of the renowned goldsmith Salomone de Sesso who worked in the princely courts of Renaissance Italy. While courtly consumption of luxury goods in the Italian peninsula relied on such urban centers as Venice, Milan, Florence and Paris, the princes associated with the Far East court salaried a local goldsmith to create objects whose novelty and quality symbolized their political power and social distinction. Cast in precious metals and often decorated in gemstones and colored enamel, the objects attracted attention throughout early modern Europe. The cultural biography of these objects insists on their singularity. These sumptuous objects are valuable not only for their fine craftsmanship and material magnificence, but also as we learn through their historical significance. As Tamar meticulously demonstrates, archival records confirm that embedded in their shiny surfaces are stories of ingenuity and incarceration, friendship and enmity, sodomy and apostasy. Salomone de Sesso was a virtuoso goldsmith whose artistic production was coveted by the princely classes. Son of a Jewish moneylender, Salomone gained knowledge of the precious metals marketplace from the expensive pledges pawned at his family's bank. No extant records detail where he attained his professional training in drafting, operating a furnace, and molding, beading, alloying, and incising metals. Nevertheless, Tamar's research indicates that by 1487, Marquis Francesco Gonzaga had already employed Salomone as a goldsmith in the Mantovano region, and Duchess Eleonora of Aragon referred to him as her goldsmith in the court of Ferrara. Though a gifted artist, Salomone regularly found himself in financial straits and political peril. For example, Francesco Gonzaga accused him of stealing gold from the amount the Marquis provided for an elaborate chain. And Manchuan Jews, as Tamar just discussed, accused Salomone of sodomy that led to his imprisonment and impending execution. Eleonora of Aragon ultimately intervened on the goldsmith's behalf. In releasing him from prison, Eleonora could not only enrich her jewelry collection, but also ensure Salomone's conversion to Christianity. From the baptismal font, Salomone the Jew became Ercole de Fedeli, one of the Christian faithful. Tamar's study is a major feat in archival sleuthing, and this book is a veritable page turner. Through careful analyses of contemporary letters, inventories, payment records, notorial registries, guild regulations and chronicles in eight Italian archives, Tamar provides a documentary description of Salomone's life and that of his family, as well as the events that led to their conver conversion. Conversion in early modern Italy most often came at a steep cost. For example, if a Christian man decided not to marry a converted Jewess following her baptism, the neophyte would most likely face destitution. Upon conversion, she could no longer receive financial support from Jewish kindred and thus would leave a life of misery. In the case of Ercole, ne Salomone, Tamar underscores the benefits the goldsmith received from conversion as princely protection saved the artist's life and his livelihood. Demand for his work continued throughout much of his life until the Italian wars devastated the economy. 
Tamar focuses on the biographical travails of Salomone slash Ercole, but for me, the art historian, his glittery objects steal the show. Methodologically, Tamar studies the socio-historical and religious significance of Salomone's life and his of, but um, which will undoubtedly draw attention from multiple disciplines as represented here today. In particular, she called documents that would be of unique interest to the interdisciplinary scholars of material culture studies. The luminescent splendor of bodily ornament discussed in her book physicalizes princely power and seniorial status. As art historian Timothy McCall reminds us, the courtly virtue of splendore, meaning to shine, glitter, gleam, glisten, exemplify the centrality of radiance to the Italian Renaissance principalities. McCall writes the honorific titles with which lords were addressed in letters and presumably life, such as illustrissimas or spectables, further indicate both that ideals of nobility often related to light for the former and that the visual attention should be directed to these men for the latter. Art historian Adrian Randolph further refers to the shiny splendor of princely patronage as, and here I quote, the luster of authority to underscore the social significance of material display. Salomone's sumptuous accessories adorn the bodies of Faris and Manchuin Signore actively produced their princely power. His works did not merely reflect princely grandeur from their sparkly surface, or complement princely power through conspicuous consumption. Instead, these metallic bejeweled and enameled artifacts shaped their political authority. The fate of the subject, Salomone or Ercole, relied on the desire for his objects. Salomone's conversion may have catalyzed his release from prison, but the inimitability of his art saved him from imminent death. In fact, Marquesa of Mantua, Isabella d'Este imprisoned the goldsmith again post-conversion to compel him to complete her bracelets. Isabella was renowned for setting her sights on the international marketplace for objects such, such as ostrich feathers, black velvets, and perfume gloves. But she was able to develop the production of local luxury through her patronage of Salomone's wares. As art historian Evelyn Welch observes, Isabella Deste had a quote, reputation for high standards in innovative, innovative design and insisted on exceptional quality and novelty in the accessories that adorned her body. The gleaming gold ornamentation of Salomone's bracelets and baubles extravagantly proclaimed her position at court through the allure of her shimmering body. It is the objects that assert her presence and her power. Jean Baudrillard observes, we always lived off the splendor of the subject and the poverty of the object. In Tamar's erudite and original pages, the objects activate the subject to reveal their supremacy. It is through the world of the object, the commodity, the thing that we understand culture. Tamar's book, Enriching Our Knowledge of Jewish Life in Early Modern Italy, offers a study in bodily ornament that complicates relations between custom and costume, subject and object, corporality and materiality. Indeed, Tamar gives us an object lesson in bodily ornament that marks seniorial ambition vis-a-vis -vis radiance and shine. Thank you. Congratulations. Mazel tov, Tamar. Thank you, Dana. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And our second speaker is Professor Mary Lebo. Well, hello, everybody. Um, and uh, many thanks to Manuela for the invitation and, and thanks to Tamar for the um, fantastic book. And uh, thanks already to, to Dana, and I'm sure in due course to Murray for some incredibly um, insightful observations. This, as you already will have realized, is a really remarkable uh, book that connects to many areas of history, religion, sexuality, 
art, economics, war, and politics. And it takes us into myriad spaces, the craft workshop, the convent, the princely court, the prison, the pawn bank, the Jewish tavern, to name just a few. It's a micro history of the best kind in that the story of Salomone, the goldsmith, sheds bright rays of light across the early modern milieu in which he lived and worked. But unlike many micro histories, it doesn't derive from the gift of a set of court records, as with Menocchio in Carlo Ginzburg's Cheese and the Worms, or Arnaud Duty in Natalie Davis's Return of Martin Guerre. Nor does it derive from the gift of an ego document, as with the autobiography of the Venetian rabbi, Leon of Modena. No single documentary source of this kind fell into Tamar's lap, but rather the long and uh, I suspect quite unwieldy uh, paper trail to which she's already alluded. Indeed, we can tell from the 120 odd pages of footnotes that this has been an extraordinarily challenging exercise in reconstruction. Tamara is not just a brilliant historian, she is also a maestra of the jigsaw puzzle. It will be clear that there's something for everyone in this book. Some of my favourite uh, bits relate to Tamar's attentiveness to the goldsmith's family and especially his women folk. Tamar has a keen ear for the emotional content of Renaissance letters and for documentary silences. Again and again, she draws attention to the profoundly gendered nature of the documentation. The fact that we don't even know the Jewish names of Salomone's wife and daughters is indicative. In fact, names turn out to be one of the themes that run through the book. Following his conversion, um, Salomone is christened Ercole after the Duke of Ferrara. His wife becomes Eleonora after the Duchess. His son, Grazia Dio, is renamed Alfonso after the Deste's own son and heir, etc., etc. As the goldsmith becomes older, he takes to deploying his full Christian name, Arcole dei Fideli, one of the faithful, to emphasize his pious credentials. Then there are Salomone's daughter whose original name is unknown, but who takes on the name of Caterina at her conversion, and then Suor Teodora upon entering a convent. Tamar reminds us of the goldsmith's split identity by usually referring to him as Salomone slash Ercole. The shifting names of our characters beholden to their patrons alerts us to the precariousness of the convert's position in society. After his baptism, persistent references to Ercole, the former Jew, suggest that it was not easy to efface one's previous identity. Now for me, as for Dana, I think, uh, one of the principal contributions of the book is to the history of material culture. And this is perhaps slightly counterintuitive since so little of Salomone's material oeuvre actually survives. Um, a couple of mighty uh, swords um, as Tamara has already shown us, but apparently none of the small objects, the manilie, bracelets, tondi, uh, these medallions worn pinned to men's hats, um, and the gold buttons, which loom so large in the correspondence of Isabella d'Este regarding her favourite goldsmith. From these records, we're able to glimpse at once the delicacy, fragility, and value of small but perfectly formed ornaments and to gain a sense of, of both material agency, but also the resistance of materials. A golden bracelet could be years in the making, and it would often come back to the workshop in order to be mended in the following years. The risks and challenges of working with precious metals are also illustrated in detail. At the end of his life, in his um, sixties, the goldsmith was clearly a very sick man suffering the results of decades of work at the furnace, inhaling dangerous fumes deriving from nitric acid, coal and molten metals. Salomone slash Arcole was also living on the breadline, unable to buy the materials that were crucial for his work, like rosichiero, a substance necessary for enameling, and reduced to pawning the gold that his patron had supplied for his commissions. 
But at the same time, we see the ways in which Salomone or Ercole successfully marketed his skill. Renaissance scholars in the audience will be very familiar with the argument of Michael Baxendale in his classic work, Painting and Experience in 15th century Italy, that at some point during this period, the desires of patrons led them away from the purchase of precious materials and pigments, gold, silver, lapis lazuli, etc., to the purchase of skill. This was the commodity that Ercole was able to sell, not just for money, but also for favours, status, and in 1491, of course, for his own survival. Shortly before his own near downfall, Salomone asked his patron, Isabella, to intervene in favour of a kinsman and fellow Jew, the moneylender Davide Finzi, who sought permission to continue to live and apply his trade in Fontanellato in the Duchy of Milan. Isabella complied, agreeing to write to her brother-in-law, Ludovico Sforza, on behalf of the Jew. The Marchesa explained her position to Ludovico. Since I favour the aforementioned Salomone, because he is very able, molto virtuoso, and refined in his craft, I shall willingly see his, his wish being granted. That is, that his brother-in-law, Davide Finzi, be allowed to stay in this land under Sforza rule so that he can support his family and live industriously. So at this point, when his artistic uh, credit was high, Salomone was able to manipulate his patron to carry out favours, not just for himself, but for his wider um, network, thanks to his prized skill. In later life, Ercole remained acutely aware of the value of his own skill. When asked to repair some tondi, these um, medallions that men put in their berets, um, which had been made by another goldsmith, Ercole complains that they've been badly made and without sense, but if he be permitted to remake them, they will be of beautiful appearance and far more pleasing to his patron. But the origins of Salomone's skill, as Dana has already um, intimated, are far from expected. Whereas we might imagine that the great Renaissance artists would have been trained from childhood as apprentices in the workshops of experienced practitioners, Salomone's professional formation was, as we've heard, initially not as a goldsmith, but as a moneylender. So we get a glimpse here of another kind of material knowledge rarely discussed. As a young Jew growing up in Bologna, Salomone would never have been allowed to join the Goldsmiths Guild, but he developed knowledge of precious metals and gems, because as a pawnbroker, he needed to be able to weigh and assess the value of these precious things. There was much more to learn, of course, in the crafting of metals and in disegno, the designs and drawings for which would later, he would later be famed. And Salomone evidently went off and trained with a goldsmith in Mantua. But here we see a more fluid approach to understanding material skill that takes us out of the straitjacket of Renaissance guilds. It demonstrates how knowledge acquired in one sphere might be deployed elsewhere, and thereby opens the doors to the possibility of minority groups and women, who are often excluded from formal participation in the guilds, contributing to the culture of the Renaissance. Tamar notes that Salomone's, or Ercole's, wife would have carried out unskilled labour in his workshop, but who is to say that she did not also carry out skilled labour? A final thought. When the goldsmith's daughter entered the convent of Santa Catarina da Siena in 1501, aged 22, she took the name Teodora, a fitting name for a nun, recalling the early Christian virgin martyr and meaning literally gift from God. But perhaps the resonant of Teodora with Doro or Dorata, made of gold, resonated with her own childhood growing up in the goldsmith's shop. No doubt she also knew a thing or two about precious metals. Thank you, Tamar, for a stunning and stimulating book. And thank you, Mary, for this wonderful uh, talk. And now, uh, Professor Rubin, please. There's something reassuring about the fact that uh, I'm coming at the end and I will sort of 
not repeat, I hope, but definitely uh, um, you will recognize some of the ideas and, and even phrases that we've already that we've already heard. So, like many fine micro storie, a convert's tale opens with an arresting scene. A family at a baptismal font surrounded by ducal patrons, their lives about to change forever as they were reborn as Christians. The place was the Cathedral of Ferrara with its imposing Romanesque interior. The time was 9 October 1491. And the dramatis personae, as we heard, were the Jewish goldsmith Salomone and his son, who as Christians were named after their patrons, Ercole and Alfonso. Uh, the lead convert was the court's favorite goldsmith, one described by Isabella d'Este, their daughter-in-law, as molto virtuoso, with a penchant for gold jewelry and finely engraved gilt swords. The newly born Christian Ercole ascended the pulpit and delivered an oration of sorts. He was probably helped in preparing it by the friar who guided his conversion, the Augustinian Fra Mariano, known for his fiery anti-Jewish sermons, and expounded uh, the texts central, so central to Jewish-Christian polemic, the interpretation of uh, Isaiah 714 as foretelling uh, the incarnation of Christ. Yet for all its exegetical poignancy, Salomone's conversion was part of a deal by which he avoided punishment for sodomy and possibly for murder, accusations that followed him from Mantua, where his Jewish accusers, his erstwhile neighbors, were still keen to see him punished. Soon after the ceremony in the cathedral, Salomone Ercole's wife became Christian Eleonora and his other offspring became Ferrante, Anna and Caterina. Caterina was to undergo another life change, indeed a conversion, as it was called, uh, the taking of uh, monastic vows, when she took those uh, that turned her from a servant to the nun Theodora. Starting with the conversion of father and son, Tamar Herzig tells the life stories of the people and objects in Salamone Ercole's life his close and extended family in Ferrara and elsewhere, his professional service to exalted patrons and the luxurious artifacts he produced, pawned, bought, maybe stole in the cities that were the stages of his life, Bologna, Mantua, Florence and Ferrara. Tamar is able to tell this story thanks to her impressive deployment of a whole array of historical skills and insights as we've heard to very rich sources. If her convert's tale is a chapter in Jewish history, then it forms part of the current wave of writing histories of Jews as arising from documents of practice, those of cities and states and guilds, uh, documents of governance and of account, to which she adds material objects too, as we have heard. Salomone Ercole spent many hours seated hunched over his bench in his workshop, as Mary has evoked so well, so I'm going to cut out a little here. And Tamar conveys well the pain and even drudgery of labor, as well as the precariousness of the laborer's life, even one so talented and well-connected as Salomone Ercole. There was professional competition and jealousy, there was the burden of sourcing expensive materials, the inability ever to say no to a commission because there may not be another one readily uh, available soon after, and the pressure of impending deadlines. Some of that sounds quite familiar to academics. All these added up to a life of anxiety, of mental and physical ill health, and we have rarely known an artist or artisan considered so effectively as the figure of, uh, of Salomone Ercole arises from Tamar's pages. And yet, for all the detail and fascination of a convert's tale, it cannot reveal what conversion meant in terms of Salomone's identity and sense of self. Most studies of conversion in these earlier centuries are based on the opinions of theologians and rabbis, or interpret, sometimes overinterpret hostile court proceedings like those produced by inquisitorial trials. 
only rarely can historians fathom the experience of conversion. And when we do, we expect it to be dramatic, a dramatic change to affect daily bodily routines and the sense of self in the world. We also expect conversion to be process, unfinished, vexing, an existential challenge. Where conversion occurred following public violence, as in Aragon in 1391, whole communities remained in their neighborhoods. Uh, they became conversos without actually changing their dwellings or indeed their occupations. But soul conversion was different, was more exposing, uh, we expect the story to be more distinctively individual, and we crave to know it in greater detail. A convert's tale invites us to consider conversion as a solution to a pressing problem, an alleviation of trouble in a manner uniquely open to Jews, whose conversion was so prized by rulers as trophies of sorts. Tamar tells Salomone Ercole's life so well, with all its turbulence, a life of debt and penury in the midst of court magnificence. Yet what being or having been a Jew meant to him remains a sort of enigma. When he visits his dead father's home in Mantua to collect what was what belonged to him by law, Salomone Ercole takes away some Hebrew books. Was this a nostalgic gesture towards his Jewish past, or just a sensible move with an eye to profit, since in Ferrara, Hebrew books were in great demand? A convert's tale thus teaches us a great deal and leaves us wanting more. All this promises, as this panel shows, that this will be a book much read and discussed by historians of all inclinations and by many others. Thank you, Tamar. And uh, thank you, um, Miri. And maybe I will start the second part of this discussion by um, inviting Tamal to respond to, summarize, suggest ideas to continue the conversation among the uh, four of you or the five of us, and then I'll open the floor. Okay. I'll start then. I can talk about this book forever and ever, so you should stop me at some point. I will in five minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, because I, as people who, I saw now Mako and Anegbi here before, so she knows I can talk about this, uh, I can talk about this book forever and ever. Anyway, um, it, it was indeed very frustrating to not really find any real echo document that could reveal um, anything about the actual religious faith or religious feelings of the uh, protagonist of my book or for that matter any uh, member of his family. Um, I did find six letters that he wrote, one before his conversion and, and five after his baptism. And uh, uh, two of them even mention God, but it is a, a very, the, the mention of God is just uh, either a, as a figure of speech or just to prove that he's, uh, um, he was always suspected of not being truthful. So it was, uh, it was a way of uh, kind of trying to counter this uh, uh, um, bad reputation that he had. But, um, but his own writings that survived, um, only deal with his professional and artistic um, um, identity. And I think this is also, uh, this is very important also for the way we see conversion and we think about conversion. Um, um, we think that when people converted, we assume that um, religion was very important for them. But for this particular person, we can tell this by the way he signed his name uh, in his letters, both before and after his conversion compared to the way other people identified him. First as Salomone Ebreo or Salomone the Jew, and then later on as uh, um, Salomone the former Jew, whereas he signed always as Salomone Orefice, 
Salomon and the goldsmith, because then and then the goldsmith of whoever pet patron, aristocratic patron he was currently working on. And um, and it is very clear that the things he was uh, um, particularly interested in, in these letters that were preserved, were professional issues, the kind of material, kinds of materials he was working with, uh, getting extensions for the um, deadlines that he was given so that he could complete specific works to the very exacting high standard that he had for his own uh, 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 works, for his uh, um, artistic, um, the artist artistic quality that he produced. And, um, and what we can know is the way conversion affected his, um, his daily life. The fact that he started working on Saturday, and we know this because uh, Isabella Desta sent uh, people to spy on him to make sure that he's really at work every single day uh, of the work week, so not Sunday, uh, of the Christian work week, that he's working on her commission so that she can get, as she said, it, she can get her uh, um, bracelets um, during the summer because she needs to have them during the summer when the arms uh, are exposed and everyone can see the uh, artistic uh, uh, bracelets that she's wearing, um, the exquisite bracelets that she's putting on. So this is how we know that he worked on Saturday. We know that he never, I mean, he got in trouble repeatedly for debt, for not being able to um, meet the deadlines uh, given by his aristocratic patrons, but he was never really charged with Judaizing or with reverting or with blasphemy or with any kind of a religious uh, um, transgression, which means perhaps that he really, you know, the person was, the, the man was an artist and, and he really mainly cared about his artistic work, I think. Many of us who are very passionate about her, our own creative work um, are, can, can really sympathize with that. I think this is probably one of the reasons I was so attracted to his figure. It's not a, a, not a very positive figure. I mean, he did quite a few not very ethical things during his life, but but his passion for, for art and for his uh, the importance that he ascribed to, to um, goldsmithry is really is very impressive. Um, so that is what I have to say about the, the meaning of conversion. I mean, we, we're always, we're looking for this kind of inner turn of the soul. And, uh, and I was looking for it too. And I just, you know, I, I could not find it. it. It's not there. Uh, what, what is there is the way Christians thought about converts as being insincere. Um, and uh, Jews who thought of converts as being insincere and the converts themselves trying really hard to pass as one of the faithful. So we have this kind of social construction of conversion, which as Miri, uh, Miri Rubin's own work, uh, a wonderful edited book on conversion uh, has shown uh, this is one of the main things that we can say about the historical phenomenon of conversion to Christianity, that it was really socially constructed, um, like so many other things. Um, I love the idea of uh, Teodora. I was really, uh, I did that, that Mary uh, brought up. It, um, I was trying to think about why she chose this particular name um, and uh, and couldn't really find a meaning. So I'm, 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 I should definitely give that a thought. It's a good, uh, uh, definitely a good direction. And, um, and, I did find myself for the first time um, as a historian, trained as a historian of, of uh, Christianity, being really uh, interested in material culture and the way objects are, are produced. And that was one of the great joys of working on this book. I actually uh, um, had the opportunity to just read a lot about you know, how, how Goldsmith worked with gold and what kind of professional hazards they had. And it really gave me a feeling, a, a sense of what daily life was like for, for people of this particular uh, uh, social group. Um, so thank you, Dana, also for, for emphasizing this aspect of the, uh, the objects that figure in the book. Here too, there's this discrepancy that objects really figure in so many of the documents that I found. 
really most of them, most of the letters, uh, most of the documents that I worked with were uh, letters from the correspondence of the Esten Gonzaga uh, patrons with him or with their agents. And, um, and so many of them focused on a particular work that they commissioned from him. And these works were uh, are either or have not survived or cannot be identified. So um, I, I have very many descriptions of the work process and even of the final uh, artworks, but the objects themselves have not survived. So this is kind of like the other um, side of the picture that uh, um, Miri mentioned. We have a, a book about conversion, but we don't know what conversion meant for the convert. And we have a book about objects that have not survived, the swords that did survive um, are not mentioned in any of the documents that I found in uh, Ferrara, Mantua, Florence, and Bologna. So their attribution is based mainly on, on um, art historians' work. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy, very much. Um, speaking of identity, I'll say two things and then uh, let maybe Dana to start uh, the round table. Um, I really like Mary's comment about uh, trophies and and I was thinking speaking of identity what does it mean to what does it mean for a person who has been producing trophies all his life to become a trophy a trophy of conversion or for uh, somebody who's producing ornaments to become an ornament ornament uh, that, that that is adding to the luster of a specific woman or man in it caught. Uh, this is one thing about identity. Another thing about identity that comes to mind is, of course, that both he and his daughter continue to be referred to as the Jew and the Jewess. Uh, th this could be read in all sorts of different ways. There's only one way. There is not only one way to read it, but still it's very significant and, and, and interesting. Um, Dana, do you want to take us from here? Sure. So I um, see Tamar annually at the Renaissance Society of America, where we're both discipline reps, Tamar for religion and me for Jewish studies. Not um, anymore. I've finished uh, my seven years. I, I'm on my eighth year. Somehow they keep roping me in. in but, what's in <laughs> but what's interesting about it is um, before, right when the pandemic hit, I had organized a panel called the Non-Extant that I'm organizing with a friend at Lewis and Clark College here in Portland, thinking about how you write a history or an art history with objects that no longer survive. And Tamar's study has brought to fruition how you do that, right? Not only through documents, but also what I like about it is also through speculation, right? Like we need that investigative, like when I say sleuthing, I really do mean that you sleuth through these documents to kind of create an art history of things that don't survive. And ironically, um, on Tuesday, I'm teaching an essay by Evelyn Welch on scented buttons. We're thinking about the sensorium, which I'm just gonna, gonna come full circle where we are now in um, the pandemic. But these pomanders that you mentioned that Salomone de Sesame, they were often filled with resin, musk, oils, and resin um, that were used to fight off the plague. So maybe instead of my KN95, I could go, go to class with one of Salomone de Sesto's pomanders because maybe we need it. Mary, Mary. Yeah, maybe go ahead. Mary or Mary? Mary, Mary go ahead. You sure? Mary, are you, you raise, raising? You'll, you'll raise your hand first. Are you sure? Okay. So um, I've just noticed recently, um, I go to a lot, well, don't go. I, I, I sit at a screen in many, many events, uh, but also before COVID that have to do with material culture and so on. And it's really interesting how increasingly, or how people talk are talking more and more about labor. That is to say, we started I don't know when it was, Mary will know best, 10, 15 years ago exploring because we wanted to get it experience. But the experience of, as it were, the user, the recipient, the, we thought it would reveal as it did in the case of your project about domestic devotion, uh, people we don't usually get to know through modest objects that they use in the course of their religious life or, or other aspects of their life. 
But interestingly, I mean, I, the most recently, I remember in the last Leeds that I attended face to face that Aidan Kumler, who's an art historian, a sort of medieval art historian, and she she just showed, um, she just looked at some um, manuscript illuminations and she did the whole iconographical thing. And then she said, now let's think about the labor that goes into this. The labor of, um, of you know, well, Mary evoked it, the fumes, the pressure. And, and of course, Tamar has added so well, the whole issue of the business of sourcing and managing, managing accounts. He was obviously hopeless at managing uh, uh, um, his affairs. And, and you, you really gave such a strong account of this sort of, this this sort of vulnerable and 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 painful existence of this highly situated artisan, and I think that that's an interesting development. Thanks through the material culture, which we sort of went looking at. Certain, we we hope material culture will take us. Material things will take us somewhere, and in fact, it's taken us also to this issue of production, of labor, of making, of the pain of making, and of course in Hebrew, well, not only in Hebrew, but I mean, it is, and translations of the Bible, this emphasis that the same word is used for labor and for pain. So, um, and, and you know, but it starts in the Bible and the, the Hebrew Bible, and then it's sort of carried over. So I, I just thought that was a, a remarkable, uh, um, you, you, just, you just had the right materials and of course the right sensibility. And as Dana just said, the willingness to speculate uh, uh, that made him emerge in the fullness of this sort of precarious mental and physical existence. Mary. Well, I don't know if I have any, any more to um, add, but um, I certainly have a, a question uh, to ask from those of you, and this is pretty much everybody who is far more uh, informed about Jewish history than I am. Reading uh, Tamar's book, I, it really kind of crystallised for me what the problem is of uh, trying to write the history of Jewish artists, which is on the one hand, um, there are the uh, rabbinical prohibitions on figurative art, and on the other hand, there are the uh, prohibitions from, from guilds of letting Jewish artists in. Um, and it seemed to me again that uh, focusing on this, this goldsmith with this rather kind of unusual career, was um, a brilliant way out of this impasse. Um, and I wondered whether you or Dana or anybody else could give me a sense of how this might be a route to further discoveries about the role of Jewish artists um, in Renaissance Italy. Answer. Should I try to answer? I mean, I'm not yeah, sure. sure. There, uh, I see art historians in the audience, so I'm going to need it. You should prepare because I'm going to turn the question to you soon. Mm -hmm. But um, but first, I'll try to say what I know. Um, I do think that this double uh, um, problem that you mentioned um, really did lead uh, many artistically inclined Jews to pursue um, decorative arts uh, and especially goldsmithery that they could just do without having to deal with the prohibitions on, on the uh, um, art of the uh, um, of the figure and and indeed we know that in Mantua where uh, which is where Salomon started working early on even before he got to Ferrara as a goldsmith there were quite a few Jewish goldsmiths it was one of the Jewish professions uh, there there Later on, uh, there, was, there, there was even a, a street named the Street of the Jewish Goldsmith in Mantua. So uh, it was really one of the main Jewish professions. And, um, um, and of course, the problem with this kind of um, art that was uh, decorative art is that uh, either uh, much of it has not survived because it was melted down um, later on and, and reused and, and just the material was used for something else. And it was definitely not preserved the way paintings and sculptures were. And, um, and the pieces that were preserved were not, are, are very difficult to, to identify. So that is, 
I think one of the reasons we know so little about um, the uh, Jewish artists who were there, and sorry, of course, I forgot Dana is here and she's uh, an expert on, on Jewish art in the Renaissance. So Dana, I think you, you're probably the person to, to answer this question better than I did. Well, and just to add on, um, for example, in a place like Venice after ghettoization, right, you'd have a lot of, um, including women artists, Jewish women artists, creating synagogal de decorations as well. So you'll have, and ghettoization created that um, environment where those kinds of arts proliferated as well. So just to add on to what Tamara also said, I wanted to say something about Mary's comment about labor. So Michael Cole wrote this amazing award-winning article in the Art Bulletin years ago that I still teach today called Cellini's Blood. Cellini was another, we could say goldsmith, but famous sculptor. And um, Tamar alludes to him and his sodomy as well in the book. Um, but Michael Cole did the study not only of how he labored, but the gendering of that labor. So if you look at the discussions of how he, the metallurgy and the pouring of the bronze, etc. It's all very gendered male. So it is interesting, like through Tamar's study, we could get another view of how that is not only gendered, but how it's made religious in some ways, right? Another social historical way to look at that, that craft, that, that, that labor that Salomone put into his work. That is a counter distinction to the hyper-masculine way that um, Cellini talks about in his own autobiography. Willie, do you want to add? Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, congratulations, Tamar, wonderful book. And thank you for all the speakers. It was such an amazing uh, evening. Uh, just, to, I wanted to add only about the jewelry. Uh, I think it's really fortunate that uh, he makes jewelry because you do have a Jewish uh, uh, artisans who makes jewels in Renaissance Italy. I, I had a student who wrote a dissertation uh, about Venetian jewelry and she has a, a chapter about a Jewish uh, jewelry makers. And she, she has a whole chapter mm -hmm. about uh, wedding rings that were made Stasia, for Anastasia. Jewish weddings. Anastasia? Uh, Exactly, <laughs> Anastasia Butita, exactly. Uh, so I think, uh, especially in Tamar uh, uh, Hero, the distance between a uh, Christian and a uh, Jewish uh, artist is not so big. And especially in Italy, you do find a lot of similarities. I mean, uh, okay, you don't have uh, frescoes or, uh, you know, uh, sculptures by, uh, a little bit by Jewish artists, but you do find illuminated manuscript of, you know, of um, other dots, which the decoration are very similar to Christian iconography. So I think uh, it's a huge field and very, very interesting. And uh, so, so I think it's, it's not as surprising as we would uh, think. Thank you, thank you, Nirit. Um, any questions from the floor? The floor is weird from, from the other windows in front of me, from the other little squares in front of me. Or you can write to, in, through the chat. So I, if, if while we're waiting, I would like to, I would like, I, I remember Tommy the process in which you were coming into this project. I remember the degree of frustration that you could not, you're not actually interested in Jewish history. You're not even interested in Salomone, the main, the, the guy who ended up being the main character in the book. You're interested in the daughters, in the female Jewish nun. Um, I think, and Mary, of course, has raised it before, can, can you tell us more about the inability? Sometimes learning how to find things is, is crucial, but also learning how to, about the impossibility of, of finding documents can also be an interesting uh, experience. How did you try? What did you try? What was unavailable? Where, where were the, the, the dead-end roads uh, you, you, you tried to go? Yes, thank you. So um, 
this really is a project that grew out of the project that I thought I was going to pursue about uh, nuns who were converts from Judaism. And uh, um, I had photocopies of a chronicle of a convent in Ferrara, Santa Caterina da Siena in Ferrara, um, that I photocopied back when I was uh, doing my dissertation research, working on uh, well, women in the Civil Roland movement. And uh, this was one of the uh, key um, uh, strongholds of Savonarola and devotion um, in, in the, at the turn of the 15th and 16th century and, uh, and the convent in which Savonarola's own niece, uh, uh, sister Girolama Savonarola, uh, professed. So, um, so I had the photocopies and I looked at this. It's an interesting convent for many reasons and the chronicle was never published. And I found a concentration of quite a few, um, first there were tertiaries, then they became nuns. The whole convent became a second order convent, uh, Dominican convent. Um, and quite a few of the nuns who joined the community in the, in the first years of the 16th century and later on were uh, identified as former Jews, as baptized Jews. And I was interested in this community and, and in what brought the uh, particular uh, baptized Jewish girls there, I thought I'm going to write this uh, um, comparative study of, of the experience of uh, baptized Jews in convents and how their Jewish origins affected their spiritual experiences and how they selected the specific convents that they joined. They joined. Um, and uh, Sister uh, Teodora, uh, the former Katerina, whose original Jewish name we don't know, uh, but I just love Mary's idea about the uh, choice of the, the, this particular monastic name, this spiritual name. Um, she was one of the first uh, the first women who joined this particular Savonarola community, um, so I was interested in her. And I have to say that um, during all those years that I was researching this family, I mean, I was looking in the beginning for information about her, uh, just her life in the convent, um, what it was like. And I just couldn't find anything more. I mean, she's mentioned in the Chronicle, she's mentioned in one other document from the convent, which is just a list of members of the community. Uh, so it's important because it, it makes her uh, identification um, more uh, certain, but it, but it didn't help me in any other way. Um, and it was also typical of what I could find about the women in the family. Um, because I was, I was initially interested in her, then I thought I will just find out more about uh, how the family converted. I uh, found out that she, she didn't really choose to convert. She converted after the rest of her family converted. Um, they were basically forced to convert following the father. Um, and, uh, and I do speculate in the book about how the, the kind of spiritual journey that she may have gone through um, because just by her baptismal name, um, it, it makes sense that she did not, she was not baptized together with the rest of the family, but later on, because of the naming pattern of the other members of the family, they all get names of members of the ducal family, and she does not. Um, and her sister does, her younger sister, so that makes... Um, uh, so it makes sense that she did not convert uh, at that time, but later on. And she was already over 12, slightly over 12 by the time the family converted. So it was no longer, con she, she had to give her consent to baptism, unlike her brothers and her um, sister, who were still minor and, and could be baptized just uh, when one of the parents decided to be baptized. So I do have a chapter about her in the book and I speculate about how this reluctant convert um, ended up being baptized, not because of her own choice, then ended up joining a convent after realizing that her uh, marital prospects were not very good as the daughter of a convert who could never accumulate enough uh, financial resources just because he, um, constantly got into trouble financially. And, um, and because he had these uh, skeletons in his closet, just having been uh, accused and convicted of sodomy and, and um, converted to Christianity. Um, but, uh, but it was very frustrating that I couldn't find her um, anywhere, even when uh, anywhere 
other than in those two documents that chronicle and another document, then at some point, one of my greatest discoveries was um, the um, last will and testament of her grandmother, the convert's mother. And that was a very important document for me because it also reveals that the mother actually disinherited her son even before his conversion because he was already so heavily in debt um, in, in 1485 and he only converted in 1491. But even in this um, uh, document that was drafted at the request of a woman, of a female Jewish test testator in Bologna in 1485. She disinherits her uh, only son, but she names his future sons, his one living son and, and all future sons as her universal heirs. And nowhere does she mention either her daughters or her um, granddaughters. So she doesn't mention Katerina, sister Teodora. And um, it was, so it was very frustra frustrating in that I could really not find information about the women and girls I was interested in. Um, Salomon's wife is mentioned in one document from 1521. Um, and each one of the daughters is mentioned that one of them in two documents and the other in three documents. And that's it. Whereas Salomon himself features in dozens of documents and his sons do as well because of their professional career as, as goldsmith. Um, they're very, their life is very, is relatively well documented up to a certain point. Um, but it, it was, I didn't find what I was, what I was hoping to find, but I, it did show me a lot about gender relations and the gendering of archives and how, um, the women in this in this family were not only their destinies were shaped by the actions and decisions of the father or husband of the uh, um, the, the, the goldsmith, but they were also uh, it is it was very difficult to to find any traces of them in the archives. So the confronting the gendering of the archives, which has always been. A problem for me in my studies because I was always interested in, in women's history, but uh, but in this particular case, uh, I did end up writing about a male convert and his family and what we do not know about the uh, women and men in his family and the little we do know about the women in his family. Thank you, uh, Marshall. Very good to see you again, and please go ahead. Last time I saw you was in Rome two years ago, but you're muted. You're muted, Martel. We don't hear you. Yes, yes. Now we do. Hi, Marcel. <laughs> yes, I saw you last, Moshe, in 2006 in Florence. Wow, that's a long time ago. A long time it's... ago, and, and you in Rome, indeed. I heard you two years ago. Uh, I, I had a, just a, a question uh, about uh, the sisters of uh, Salomon, the, 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 the type of convent they went into. C can you deduct? something about what they might have done in the convent uh, in terms of work. Could you get, by a, is that a way to know more about what they did? No, it was a, a convent that was built and endowed by the Duke of Ferrara, who was a, a devotee of Savonarola and, um, and the convent was headed by the most famous Savonarolan visionary of the early 16th century. So, uh, and it was an enclosed first tertiary's house, but it was under um, strict enclosure, even though tertiaries at that time before Trent were not obligated to observe um, strict enclosure, but the, their particular rule um, required that. And later on, it, it became a Dominican, um, in 1506, it became a full-fledged Dominican second order convent. So, um, and they, I, 
and it became more upper class later on. It started um, as a more humble in terms of the background of the of the novices, and then became after Hercule Deste's uh, death, it became a more upper class. So you cannot see that something about the occupation because it's just a short remark. I was thinking of the really strange and sometimes really remarkable ways we have to find out about the occupations of nuns in monasteries. And, and probably you have read about it. I was thinking about an article that appeared, I think about two or three years ago, uh, by an archaeologist working in, um, I think, York University, Anita Radini. And she had done research on the tooth or the teeth of a German nun. The, uh, found the blue, the blue the yeah. And that's how she could deduct that she had been uh, working as an illuminator of the manuscripts. And we always thought that monks were illuminators and not the nuns. So that's a weird way to, to find, find out about that. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, Kathy. <laughs> First of all, I'd just like to say how much I've enjoyed this uh, book launch. It's been amazing to be sitting in Jerusalem and to have conversations and, and, uh, and to see all these eminent scholars among us. It's a real thrill. And congratulations, Tamar. Tamar, um, I'm always fascinated by your trail of thought and your direction, whichever research you do. And uh, Moshe said at the beginning, you are now working on female slavery. I know a little bit about this Jewish female slavery, but I wondered to what extent the convert's tale actually led you to this new research. And it'd be very interested to, to hear what the connection is between that and this. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's a funny question because uh, what led me to the slavery um, project um, is once again, the inability to pursue what I wanted to pursue about the nuns who were baptized Jews. I mean, I did find um, quite a few cases. All of them led me, led me to um, uh, realize that most nuns who were baptized Jews actually joined convents, like the, the old Christian nuns, their motivation for joining convents were, was economic. Basically, they couldn't marry well or they couldn't marry at all or they were uh, sent by their fathers or their brothers immediately after the family's conversion. So it's just like, you know, here's a solution that we didn't have as Jews, but we can now get rid of these daughters and not have to spend all this money on their marital dowry. We can save about four-fifths of what we would have had to pay. Um, so one of the cases, so I had a, Actually, I did have this project and several articles came out of it, but I decided not to turn it into a book length project uh, eventually. And um, and one of the cases that I did find was the uh, sister Todora and that turned into the uh, convert's tale. And another case that I found uh, was about a, a formerly Jewish nun who was actually a former slave. So uh, this is, uh, she was a, a girl who was enslaved um, in, uh, they say Tunis, but it's not, um, not, not clear, uh, somewhere in North Africa um, as a girl in the early 16th century was brought to Florence uh, um, and uh, served as a slave. Uh, the, a Christian family in Florence of very wealthy merchants and then when the girls that she was taking care of grew up um, and got married, she was um, um, uh, uh, manumitted, um, liberated and, um, and entered a convent, uh, another Savonarola convent, because these are the convents that I uh, knew of. And also the Dominicans were particularly interested in converts from Judaism. So uh, Dominican convents had uh, uh, more baptized Jews in them. So um, I became obsessed with this other story. Uh, first of all, because I didn't know there were female Jewish slaves, that Jewish girls were enslaved and brought to Italy. So that was something that I didn't know about, uh, mainly because nobody has ever written about this. And uh, so this is what I'm working on now. <laughs> but uh, I moved from the um, nun story uh, to the broader phenomenon and, and discovered that it was uh, greater in scope than has previously been assumed. 
So thank you for this question. It's great to see you. I should add that Kathy uh, was the uh, wrote uh, one of the very first reviews um, to be published about the book and a very generous review in HNET, H Judaic in HNET. So I'm grateful for that. And to us, okay, I think I will. I think Miri wanted think... to say something earlier. Michelle? I don't know, my Mary. connection is really unreliable. I've been in and out all the time. It's it's fine. I okay. better not. Yeah. So I will thank everybody, Dan and Mar uh, Mary, Mary, uh, Tamar, of course, Manuela, and of course, all of the audience that joined us this evening. It's a wonderful book. Those of you who have not read it, I'm sure would go now and, and, and read it and really thank all of the participants and all of the people who came from all over really from, from, from Portland uh, to England uh, to, to Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Thank you, everybody. And those Thank of you for whom it's night, good night. Thank you, Moshe. Bye-bye. See you Thank all. You, Moshe. Thank you, Tamar. Thank you, Dan and Miri and Mary. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for uh, being here. And thank you to the speakers. And thank you, Manuela, for organizing this. Bye. תודה משה. נסיעה טובה משה.